Disruptors and curious minds. Welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name's Jeremy. This is Mark. We get to talk Hi. to the bil builders and futurists and people that are creating the next version of the world that we will all participate in in one form or another. Today is a new format. We're super excited. <laughs> we always look to shake things up. We like to test things. Today, uh, today this format is actually called Two Plus Three. We uh, each are going to bring a topic. Catchy that, title. Uh, you like that? Is there's it's got um as you say over the pond, it's got the maths involved. Yeah. It doesn't have very much like SEO in it. It's not very easy to find the find it on Spotify, but yeah, I like it. Yeah, hey, <laughs> it's 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 a riff that turns into a pilot that may become a new format. Who knows? But hey, that's why we're here. It's all about being flexible and figuring things out. Um, so the format is two topics. I bring one, Mark brings one, we riff on it. And then we get to hear from you guys. We actually got a bunch of questions that were submitted and uh, we're going to run through some of these questions. We're committing to three, but if we get more, we'll, we'll get more. So fire them in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking about. Uh, no parameters. You can put any question in there. We'll do our best to address it. Mark, let's can get I going. just add that? It, like, if you listen to this after the event, because we record live, but you might be listening to this on Spotify or Apple or YouTube, whatever. Put the questions in the comments, and we'll answer them next time. We are actually pretty pretty diligent about that. So, uh, yeah, please please do. Mark, you want to you want to you want to start with yours? Uh, I know I know there's a lot of angst on this topic. Um, I know there's a lot of. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Hit it. I, I, before we start, I just think I have a feeling that whenever we do this, we're just going to end up raging against whatever machine we are talking about on. Maybe it's, just, it's something about the disgruntled anger of a lot of the things we're going to talk about that, we, that kind of maybe contradicts a lot of what some of our guests are saying. Um, but I will bring friend tech. So I'll start with Web3. You're going on to Apple in a minute. I'll start with Web3 blockchain and friend tech or the demise of friend tech and the non-surprising, in my opinion, demise of friend tech. Do you know what friend tech is? If I say it again, Jeremy? You said it a bunch of times. You get paid. There's the <laughs> bell ring every time we say it. No, um, I actually looked at I actually looked it up. I wasn't super familiar with it, but I did some did some research on it today. And it's basically a social media platform or was a social media platform. Well, I guess it still is, but you just can't really make changes to it unless someone decides to fork it, right? But um you you can pay... can you even fork it now if the if the admin's been sent to the the Ethereum zero address? I don't know. We need somebody techie, perhaps it can be. I don't know. That's um, a good question. Yeah. But but allegedly the the what what the premise was at least as I understand it and you can you feel free to correct me because you are well more educated on this topic but you buy or the way it worked is you buy um uh, what did they call them not tokens but uh, well there were tokens but you you're buying shares essentially in an influencer on uh, on this social media platform and essentially it's token gated chat rooms like I look at that and I go. What? I don't, I don't, why? Like, to me, it's like, why? Like nothing about that is super compelling, but maybe you can, you can reset my disbelief. No, I, I can't because nothing about <laughs> it was compelling. Like nothing, nothing about it was compelling. And this isn't a surprise. I don't think to anybody. I mean, and I remember BitClout. So BitClout was like the predecessor to this kind of a, a, a crypto based social media platform where you could trade on your influence. So I actually, created a cat an account with bitcoin with bitclout i have a mark fielding token it was somewhere on bitclout but i lost my seed phrase so you know that that three cents uh -oh. has dis uh, disappeared but um i'll, I'll quote molly white because from uh, web web3 is going great um i'll quote her from yesterday so friend tech the development team behind Frentech has officially ditched the crypto-based social media project, which was very briefly hailed as a potential platform for influencers to earn money from their followers. It attracted crypto influencers and undisclosed seed funding from the crypto venture capital firm Paradigm. Launched in August 2023, token launched in May 2024. Okay, this is very short timelines. On September the 7th, the team reassigned ownership and admin rights to the smart contracts to the burn address on Ethereum, making them permanently inaccessible. Footnote, the team is estimated to have made around 44 to $60 million in fees, uh, which I think is job well done for them. 
and all the suckers out there who actually thought that this would work. Um, I'm sorry. Lost That's great. So, yeah, yeah. So the, so the fees that were earned, they're walking out with a bag of cash and they're shutting down a platform that people helped fund and create value for, right? Because a platform is worthless unless you have people doing things on the platform, right? So they got people doing things on the platform. Yeah, they drummed up, they drummed up transactions and they drummed up some influences and they, they had an airdrop, didn't they? And that was kind of what built the momentum for the token drop. And then obviously everyone dumped their tokens has happened, is happening across Web3, across crypto at the moment. And the upshot is it, it was worth three, three dollars or something when it was launched. Now it's worth 0.07. It's going to be worth nothing by the end of next week, isn't it? Um, and so the founders, but, but my question isn't about, I'm not angry so much about this because it, it was obvious it was going to happen. What I, I want to know is, I got a question for you. So we've spoken a lot about Web3. We've had some guests on Web3. We talk about incentives. We talk about this dream that, decentralized tech can give us ownership can give us accountability and transparency and it can give you content creators their own you know it's very a very rousing incredibly rousing promise rabble rousing <laughs> wow but <laughs> is and i got to thinking okay about social media more is social media the hardest nut to crack for web3 or the easiest because you think it's low lying fruit okay you get a bunch of people they like each other they comment they share they whatever but turns out it's actually really it's it, it virtually impossible to crack the status quo of social media platforms and and forever it will remain z thus no i i i no i don't know i don't I, so, people just don't care do they here's here's the thing that, that, that where like the um the rousing aspect of what this technology can do essentially turning creators into their own platforms and establishing one-to-one -one connections with their audience that they can choose to create their own experiences and adventures through this you're i always talk about it as building audience infrastructure you've got this infrastructure on a on a you directly to all of your audience members that you could actually yeah monetize you could create uh experiences for them that are valuable right that the whole theory behind this is super interesting and compelling but then when you have when you have startup after startup come in and try to do something and then just go well shit this is too hard to figure out i'm not saying that's what these guys did but like you know the value equation for for friend tech just didn't like we we're like we're saying like a monetizing access to get into someone's someone's chat like I'm trying to think of who who like my super fan or my like whose chat I would want to pay money to get into. Like, I don't even know. Like, um, man, your own. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I I think something you just said. I can't remember what it was, but essentially it's about our need. Like, what what it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I mean, what do we need from a crypto based influence based because that was another thing basically the more influence you have the more valuable your participation in that became it was the same with with um bit cloud i assume it will be the same with the next iteration it seems to be like that a bit with farcaster which seems to be coming more day by day a clone of twitter which is everything they tried to get away from um the same voice is saying the same thing and yeah human need does it do we need crypto backed social media platforms well so the the influencer side right so i i kind of cringe at the word i know why it's out there i know why it's labeled that right it's a shortcut for brands to get to audiences in a way and a bunch a bunch of other you know uh means of shortcutting to a particular demographic or segment but you know some some influencers rise because their their content is truly valuable they're what they're putting out there is you know resonating and that sort of thing and then there are other ways to rise as an influencer which include you know messing with the mechanics behind the scenes to you know increase your followers increase you know all of these metrics that make you look like you're doing something valuable so um man i don't know this so what let's let's point to some is is lens protocol are they still around like are they where are they yeah. at 
So What's the think, you, think thinking on paper is on lens and tape dot X Y Z. So actually, <laughs> it's quite funny because our lens account is, and I've been meaning to speak to you about this. Basically, we get about five hundred comments per post, and they're all bots. It's just completely overrun by bots. You post uh. a short, you post a short on tape which is essentially the YouTube of the Lens Protocol, and you get hundreds of likes and lots of comments, but all the comments are X, Y, Z, 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 but they're just bots, essentially, for whatever reason, commenting. They can't even write a proper word in the comments. It's just like A, Z, E, R, Z, this gobbledygook, just hundreds and hundreds of gobbledygook comments. Wait, if it's gobbledygook, is it actually quantum data that hasn't yet been turned into information? Maybe it's quantum well, yeah. and we just need a lens to, to run it it's, through. Yeah, it's faster than the speed of like um, gobbledygook. So who Super needs that easy. noise? I don't need that noise. Like, I mean, like the the. I mean, I heard five hundred comments. I was like, holy crap, that's pretty amazing. Like, that's great engagement. But none of it is engagement. It's all automated. It's all nonsense. automated. Yeah, it's all automated nonsense. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So the so the value <laughs> equation for this mecha we have a technical mechanic that's in place that allows us to create something on chain that is this key, this ticket to this experience, to this, it's a it's a way to control access to an environment, right? And there are ways to control access to an environment without blockchain, right? Yeah. So like, it, it's, it, it goes back to like, man, there is really something interesting and compelling with the tech, but like, we just kept keep seeing these instances of it not resonating in, you know, monetary, like monetary terms, right? Financial yeah. result, and and a lot of these things are folded. Or just interest, like interest. even if even if the reward is something bloody interesting or something curious or something creative or new, but it's not. And and maybe if someone's out there who actually ha is having enjoyment on lens, of any of those the uh, lens protocol, please correct me because I think it's just a cesspit. It's not interesting. It's completely overrun by bots so any any numbers that you're seeing on it's just it's not real it's all it's fabricated smokes and mirrors wow <laughs> well so i i also uh yeah there you have it folks web3 uh, is doing just great yeah molly white's blog check it out oh my gosh um so <laughs> all right so this this i just this... got sacked from my job <laughs> <laughs> you're out you're done oh my gosh the web3 writer no, there is. There, I think there's. I mean, we all believe. I, I think there's. There's something valuable in this. In that confluence of technologies, but it, we're we're still in the lab with this stuff. We're still trying to figure it out. But I think we can't figure it out by putting by monetizing cesspits, right? Like, no, it's like the. Uh, no, you can't. And it's, it's, it seems to just be the same the same broken mechanism being repeated and i think a lot of the creativity has left the original the, the you know the the real creativity that changes the, and everyone's just using the blueprint now mm -hmm. it's hard to come up with new and compelling shit that resonates with people <laughs> like yeah, it's sure is, yeah. it's not easy it's not easy. That's to why take, we're doing this. It's much easier to take take a path that someone's already done, blow dust off it, and put a new label on it, and try something with it. Like, it's hard to create compelling shit. Um, but one, okay, pushing back on that, one of the things we've spoken about, we did this with the Nexus, was building on what came before, yep. and uh, to what extent does building on what came before just become copying what came before? <laughs> Well, let's even, we can take that. I've said this a thousand times on, on the show is like creativity is the unique arrangement of found elements, right? Like that's, that's what it is. Like no one, like uh, I can't own a G chord. You can't own a G chord. It's a collection of notes that we use and rearrange in unique form and time and space and in rhythm and all of that kind of stuff. Right. So there is a bit of that, but like what makes something truly creative is something that resonates that is compelling like it can't just be creative just to be creative it's like creative where someone goes whoa that's new and i want to be a part of that or i want to jump into that experience right so there's 
there's the there's the creativity and then there's a creative creativity that is solving something that is making something new and exciting um and that has to be part of the output too agreed good um, stuff friend tech right, there you have it mark friend, fielding friend, all right so friend, friend so jamie what are you bringing to the party so i'm bringing something to the party this is this is um this this comes from my experience in the in is the this another thing the world needs you know, I, I think it's a very interesting solution to a need that is coming up that people don't think about with AI and quantum and all of these technologies that we're all excited about. They all require hardware. They all require power. They all require cooling, right? So this is my my data center hat coming back on, right? I spent a lot of years working as a as a consultant in, in the data center world, helping people figure out where to put all these pieces of hardware, how to make them redundant, resilient, and, and design spaces that support them. So there's a company out there right now. There's actually, a, there's a lot of companies out there, but the one I want to focus on is called Lumen Orbit. Lumen Orbit. And okay. what they're doing is uh, is pretty interesting. I thought they're, you were talking about the iPhone 16. So you've completely thrown me. I like it. There's Yeah. I mean, the iPhone 16, there wasn't enough like interesting stuff to talk about with that. It sounds like it's just you know, we're, we're in it. We're, I think people are ready for a full set change in the tech Can we cycle. put you on that after? Cause I've got some rage on that. Totally. R Let's rage it. against the Apple machine. Yeah, no, no. Sorry, Lumen. So yeah, Lumen Orbit. So I read a book a long time ago called the, um, the high frontier, which I think was written in the seventies by Gerard O'Neill. Um, super sharp guy that basically was like, yo, it sounds like a Western. It, yeah, it's new. Well, eh, not really Western-y, but, uh, it involves, he's like, yo, the planet eventually is, is going to have major challenges. Um, we don't have to go to Mars. We don't have to go to the moon. We can live in lower earth orbit. And here's how we build a society. Here's how we build farms. Here's how we build places for people to live. Here's how we build industry. He laid out the whole damn plan to the point where even NASA was like, this sounds really good. Like this, <laughs> this, this could really work. And there was a bunch of budget attached to it. And then something happened where it just never really took off, I think, because there were some industries or dare we say calcified systems in place that redirected the momentum of something new and promising. When does that ever happen? Right. Um, so what these guys are doing is they're figuring out how to put data centers in space. Uh, they, they have a they have a footprint. And let me set the tone with this. Right. We've. The industry has figured out, uh, has tested multiple places to put data centers that make cooling easier, make power easier. Uh, Microsoft had a project called Natic or Natic, um, where they basically dumped like 800 servers down on the ocean floor, left them for 24 months, and they um, they basically pulled them up and they learned a bunch of stuff about it. But you know that that project is no longer they're no longer putting data centers in, you know, in the bottom of the ocean, but they tested it. <laughs> and it's really interesting. Actually, only five servers broke in that time period. How deep they, were they down? The bottom of the ocean. Like, I think it was the oh. North Sea or something crazy, like okay. literally anchoring them to the bottom of the ocean, right? Um, so, so we're testing the boundaries of like different places other than a big block of land with, you know, uh, massive power consumption, massive cooling consumption, that is putting grids at capacity. Like you have these massive centers um, of data center activity. One is Ashburn, Virginia. And you know, the power utility in Ash Ashburn, Virginia is like, they're oversubscribed and they're trying to build as fast as they can. And they can't come up with this demand because of all these, you know, AI technologies are out there. They require these, these, these huge amounts of server compute, network storage, all of that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. anyway, what these guys are doing, they, they've got it. They're, they're backed by NVIDIA. They're backed by Y Combinator. P.S. We would love to talk to you guys if for some reason Lumen Orbit is listening to this because I've got so many questions. I've, I've briefly went through the white paper and it's, it's super interesting. Um, but it's essentially five megawatts of power in a four kilometer by four kilometer section of space. And... You, the, their their idea is that you know the the launch costs are coming down right launch costs are coming down they're spitting this stuff up into space think of these like 40 think of these as like shipping containers like 40 you know 40 40 foot long i'm on the container. website i'm on the website um luminorbit.com right now and yeah you can yep. see what 
exactly what you're describing and yeah backed by nvidia at the bottom yeah so solar power you know like uninterrupted solar power passive cooling opportunities uh the whole nine yards i mean there's a lot of problems and there's a lot of problems to solve with this but there are other companies you know approaching this as well i think one is called axiom that uh axiom actually had some technology that was uh, incorporated into the ISS to do some studying and stuff. So Axiom has done some different things, not purely data center related, but human capsule kind of related and, and, and that sort of thing. But this is a really innovative approach, but pointing back to a uh, high frontier, the reason that stood out to me for the reason why high frontier would work is they didn't have to lift everything off the planet. Once they lifted uh, enough off the planet and put it into lower earth earth orbit they were able to build all the shit they need that they needed to build up there so if you can get the things to make things in space then it's really easy or it's easier to manufacture some of this stuff because some of these things are huge they're massive they're 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 big things but you know in space i can move i can move a you know five ton container very easily spinning it around in space if i'm right so, so those were a lot of the compelling, compelling things out of there. But I think, man, I think it's really interesting, and I love seeing that people are 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 looking at the the new ways to solve these old problems. Because you know, data centers, terrestrial data centers, eventually we're going to run out of space. We're going to run out of power and cooling. Right? We're going to do so much damage to the environment with these power hogs that you know we got to figure out something else. So. I want to I want to stay tracking these guys and I want to um I don't know maybe even get them on the show. Okay, on their website it says as launch costs fall orbital data centers will leverage 24/7 solar energy and passive cooling rapidly deploying to gigawatt scale avoiding permitting constraints on earth. Gigawatt scale what explain that to a layman how much how power how big is that what could that what's that the equivalent to gigawatt scale? So it's like 1000 megawatts, right? So you you hear so what would that would that would that fuel would that power of Vegas or something like how much is that? Man, I wish I had the I used to have those in my hip pocket uh to talk about, but I I don't I don't have uh don't have those as as accessible anymore. But to think about it, like <clears throat> you have these um hyper they call them hyperscale data centers. So like the Googles, the Microsofts, the, you know, a lot of these hyperscale yeah. providers are building 500 megawatt campuses, right? That are in modules of, um, you know, I don't know, module could be like 25 megawatts. So a 25 megawatt module would go in, but like these massive data centers on earth now are, are approaching the, you know, 500 megawatt, which is, you know, half a gigawatt. So, 1.21 gigawatts. I think about the Back to the Future reference was just going through my head right now. Uh, what the hell is a gigawatt? Um, but anyway, yeah, they, I mean, massive, like all this, all this AI stuff that people are talking about is going to require a lot of compute power. And, and some of the ideas, so let me go back to how they're launching, at least as I understand it. So in 2025, they're going to put 130 two pound satellite up into space and it's gonna it's gonna test their theory it's gonna test some of this stuff and then over the next you know year or so they're gonna put more satellites up there to test the capability so the idea is when these data center these orbital data centers are up there they get information sent from other satellites that are collecting sensor information camera information all kinds of information on earth so that data goes up to these satellites then uh, it goes from these satellites into these orbital data centers for processing, and then maybe it's bounced back down once it's done. Um, so it seems pretty cool, man. Is your face melted? What do you think about this? Um, it's it's a a solution, isn't it? I like the the bottom of the ocean or above our heads, so we're we're limited to where we can do that until the, the technology comes such that we don't need the space. Then space is. The next frontier, isn't it? And I think with all these private, like, is, is a SpaceX taking it up? I guess there's numerous private space um, companies who could, you could put your satellite onto their to their payload. So, so according according, according to their information on their website, Lumen Orbit is hitching a ride with this new 132 pound thing they're going to release in 2025. Hitching a ride with SpaceX, I think, to get okay, it. Okay, they are hitching a ride with lower. SpaceX. So, yeah, yeah they're making. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how. <laughs> 
how busy the the lower atmosphere is. I mean, there's only so much up there, but I guess we can take it further out into space when needs must. So here's actually here's where it is I, I, that got me thinking here's where it's like really going to get interesting so you think about like um radio transmission right and the, the fcc controls like radio bands and bandwidth and you know laser bands and all of that kind of stuff like mark you have this frequency this company owns this frequency this organ it's basically like technology real estate right so there's going to be some kind of thing that happens and there may be out there for those who are or space forward <laughs> might know whatever entity controls this but someone is going to control the the spots in space that you're able to put shit i guess but doesn't it like that's a very interesting question and d just before that would i rather pollute the sea or pollute space i guess right now i'd rather pollute space than the sea um because the sea doesn't need any more polluting but who does i thought that isn't a, a bit like open water when you when so nobody owns you go out 20 miles from from your borders from the from the from the coast and you're in open water and it's international water waters center, international right. waters does does space i mean just because the americans planted a bloody flag on the moon doesn't make it theirs i mean it's, nobody owns space do I think they? we i think we peed on it too so that makes it 100 percent legal that we Mar own you marked your territory <laughs> And there's oh. no gravity on the moon, so it'll still it'll still be there. Just it won't have dissipated. That's right. That's right. So all right. So we talked about talked about um, failed cases uh, of applying a really thoughtful uh, technological philosophy. You know, this idea of going back to what you were talking about with friend tech and the idea of like creators becoming platforms. We talked about that. We see um, not a lot of innovation happening in that space and you have to like be creative and be innovative to create something compelling that will last so hopefully we start seeing some more compelling stuff there and on this side we're talking about you know another way to solve the the problem of powering all this great technology and supporting this technology with infrastructure um and people are looking at space yeah. now big big challenges mad solutions we're gonna put days like yeah it's a it's a a massive challenge and a, and a so sometimes I, I don't want to dwell on this too much but we seem to be writing our own futures science fiction like we just have to move and move 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 everything into space um yeah looming orbit yeah let's try and get them on the show sounds good all right let's get to questions uh we we've been can, I, can we just do uh, like on uh -oh. apple because i researched apple because oh, i thought you're going to talk about the okay. apple apple so new iphone iphone 16 right iphone 16 does anybody um, care is there anything new well, first question, when was, so iPhone 16 is released on the 20th of September. There's some stuff before that, but iOS is released whatever a week before that, but the 20th. Do you remember, do you know when iPhone 15 was released? It feels like 30 seconds ago, but yeah, I don't know. Um, so less than a year ago, it was the, the, the 27th of September or something the year before. Um, what? I, I wanted to speak about this because one of our best shows was Don Norman, Humanity Centered Design. We had him on a few weeks ago and everything, everything he spoke about, Apple do the opposite. <laughs> but give me an example. I think I remember, but give me an example. Yeah. Well, essentially it was about, um, there was a lot about built-in obsolescence and the technology companies drip feeding us incremental updates of technology and millions and mil at the, the end result being millions and millions and millions of phones millions and millions and millions of tons of the raw materials needed to be to build these hundreds of millions of man hours and woman hours and child labor hours like just the impact that a new iphone has is huge and they just keep doing it within a year. Now, okay, that wouldn't be so bad if there was massive groundbreaking changes in what you're getting, perhaps. I mean, it's still just a phone, but okay. But what, how is the iPhone 16 different to the iPhone 15? How is the iPhone 15 different to the iPhone 14, which came out a year, a year ahead of that? I can give you some stats because I've got some. Um, you give me a well, there's always got There's always got to be three or four marketing points that, that say this, oh, we've got... 
the camera's better and you know maybe there's some ai integration or what they call apple intelligence i think is where their their spin on uh their spin on ai but um the humanity centered design i'm pointing back to well before you get to those stats you know that don norman talks about it talks about looking at the introduction of a new product and its effect on all of humanity it's like holy cow that's a big thing to think about right so you think about like the raw materials you think about where the hell do the old phones go oh we're going to sell we're going to repurpose them and have other people buy them but are people going to want to buy them if you tell them the new one's way better and the old one sucks like it, it, is it going to end up in a pot so thinking about the repercussions the the holistic across the world yeah population repercussions of putting a new product out there is like it's pretty heavy yeah it's 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 huge and like i could cherry pick so i've got in front of me iphone 15 versus iphone 14 um it's got the weight, the build, the sim, the type, display size, display resolution. And if you look at it, the, the, for example, the display resolution, um, the iPhone 14, 11, 70 by 2532 2 pixels, 19, 5, 9 ratio. The, 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 the 15 is exactly the same. If it, barring it, like there's maybe a hundred less on the pixel, the um, the memory, internal memory is the same. The main camera has a slight upgrade. The the video quality on the iPhone 15 and the iPhone 14, 4K at 24, 25, 30, 60 frames per second on the 15, exactly the same on the 14. Like the HDR is the same. The 1080. It's all the the modules, the selfie camera, the modules are the same. The, the sounds the same, the comms, the wheel, way like it's all either the same or like an increment bigger. And it's the same with the 16. Now, the big upgrade on the iPhone 16 is, of course, AI. They like to integrate right. a year's worth of AI technology. Which into... needs orbital data centers, apparently. Well, it does. If Well, A, it's not shipping with any of the AI because it's not ready. So according to The Verge... It's AI um, ready. AI prepared. Yeah, it's AI prepared. The first set of Apple AI, AI features is scheduled for public availability next month in most regions, not the EU, so I can't get it. Um, and interestingly enough, it will all be available on the iPhone 15 Pro anyway, so you could get it with your iOS upgrade. Here's what's included. Text rewrite. Text rewrite will morph your email writing draft into a more professional one, and you can change the tone to be friendly or concise. What if proofread. you're what if you're a better writer like yourself? Then or you then can a... proof it. Well, you know what? Thinking on paper becomes more and more poignant every single damn day. God. <laughs> Keep the paper, guys. Keep the paper. Mark and I are gonna have a Mark and I are gonna have a cavern in the middle underground somewhere that's gonna be lined in velvet curtains. It's gonna have a record player, it's gonna have a bunch of notebooks, and uh, I don't know, probably some really good beer or something. And yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be like the retro lounge. But uh there's so more check this out. More, oh, it, yeah, will, yeah, it will, yeah. it will, it will clean up or remove unwanted objects in your photos and make basically make your Instagram photos look better. How do you, you can, know what's unwanted? How do you, you know what's type, unwanted? You can type to Siri. You can transcribe your telephone calls. So obviously, every phone call you have, you can now transcribe it and send all that information to, <laughs> to back to Apple. All right, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here, Mark. You, you've. Uh, you're we it's well established that you're not an apple guy <laughs> even though it's not that though, i'm not an apple it's the same it's the same with samsung i mean I, why would i want to transcribe my telephone calls into ai and give all i mean it's all to just feed the lmm it's all just <laughs> just a, a well so so uh, let's a flywheel of doom let's flywheel of doom let's all right so uh caroline giger gigerich um gigerich yeah, uh, I remember. I always have trouble with her last name, and great she's guest, an amazing really person. Nice. Yeah, um, very nice. She actually recently posted on LinkedIn uh, a little bit about what she's excited about with with the new iPhone, and she is like, she does a great job of of saying why new tech is important. So we, she talks about a couple of things. I'm just reading right from her post, Caroline. I hope this is okay. Um, so we talk about like visual intelligence. So imagine using your iPhone to look at a restaurant and have it spit out useful details like reviews and hours. So this could be like an extension of you, but it like it QR codes everything, right? So as you're looking at something, it automatically, so it saves you the step 
of of punching things in. You know that everybody who writes a restaurant review, it's the best and it's the worst. So you just have these outliers of what the actual, you're not getting a true representation of what that meal's like. You're getting the people who hated it and the people who loved it. You're not getting the true core of, sorry, carry on. <laughs> wow. But Mark's, Mark's a little, Mark, Mark's a little spun up today. It's good. I like it, Mark. I like it. Um, okay. And then, uh, okay. So there's some AI tools, AI photo search, AI writing tools. She talks about personal context. So Siri will now be able to take actions in apps on your behalf. So I could say, send Mark pictures from this weekend's barbecue. Right. So, so there are, so I, so there are, are things that m will make things a little bit easier, but again, going back to the, how, how, how hard is life? <laughs> how hard is life? S send Mark pictures from your barbecue. I'm sorry, but that is not reason enough to, to spend billions and billions and billions of man hours and women hours and child hours and building this. I don't, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. No, I need more. What else? I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> what else? Um, let's see. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was a lot of the things pointing to the, the Apple intelligence kind of thing. Um, the visual intelligence. Do you, do you know what? Pretty, like, uh, yeah. okay, sending photos. Okay, we're all big on WhatsApp. We TikTok, whatever your choice is. Okay, we. I think we all agree now that this, the idea of these communications was oh, at the beginning. It brings us all closer together, but in fact, it doesn't because the 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 relationships become less tight because you're not interacting face to face you're interacting digitally and all this is doing is removing what so okay i have a barbecue at my friend's house and i think oh jeremy would really like to see this because he likes barbecue i'll, I'll at least make the effort to choose the right photo to maybe crop it maybe find his number put it in write a little message at least at least i'm putting something of me into that communication if i'm just going siri send jeremy a picture of the barbecue and then siri crops a picture takes the takes the the beer can out of it makes beautifies it sends it to you with some note it's constructed from my history because i it's transcribing my phone calls that is not a relationship that is the relationship between ai and you not me and you that it, it's 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 human automation. It's automating the relationship it's side. Ripping of the soul out. Ripping wow. the humanity out. It's just just say no. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's how hard is life? That's that's a really interesting thing to think about, right? Uh, and I know we're running running long on this on this on this topic. Maybe we need to rein that in. But like the the idea of like innovations happen to like make things easier for people right so way back in the day you know we're walking across the you know the planes you know that's how we do it and then all of a sudden like oh there's a wheel now we can jump on this thing that we grab this horse and this horse can pull us right oh that's pretty awesome i can cover now a heck of a lot more time or a heck of a lot more uh area than i than i could before right you know there there are tools right so i can build things and like all of these things right but when is it when does it when does it come to a point where we're 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 offloading too much like we need to do we need to do some stuff as humans right this is this is a really interesting technological dichotomy innovation dichotomy dichotomy yeah. because it's pulling us away from humanity wow all right <laughs> Uh, I'm, 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 I'm almost spun up now too. All right. So we did our two, let's do our three real quick, Mark. We've got some questions that were, that were sent in here. Um, let me throw a couple at you. Um, all right. So, you know, we, every, everyone knows we do these episodes with, with guests. We also have a book club where we read books together. This is a question related to how we tie these in together. So how and what connections, Mark, are you making between the books that we're reading and the the guests that we have on the show like what 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 sort of commonalities are you starting to see or what are some interesting ones um good question whoever sent that in thank you well i think i alluded to the one with don norman and humanity centered design and apple and this 
but I won't get back into that. Um, stay focused, Mark. Stay focused. So, okay, the the books we've done so far in book club, I would say there there's been two types of books: the quantum books, so the Order of Time, Don um, Don <laughs> Carlo Rovelli, um, Quantum Supremacy that we're reading at the moment. I think they're very specific to quantum mechanics and quantum computing. And I don't, at least I, I haven't really found a way to use that knowledge elsewhere. Maybe, maybe that's not true for the arrow of time, but clear thinking, the design of everyday thing, the nexus, it's universal wisdom, universal strategies, universal insight that you can use regardless of which technology. So a, a lot of clear thinking, if you're a founder, no matter what, you're building in if it's blockchain if it's quantum if it's ai if it's robotics whatever it is i'm sure the people at lumen orbit would get value from clear thinking and i'm sure they get value from the design of everyday things and the nexus maybe they wouldn't get so much value from the order of time or quantum supremacy yeah i think uh for me the nexus has been the one book uh by julio Otino. Julio was on our show, by the way. We got a great episode with with him. Uh, it's about connecting art, science, and technology in this space yeah. between all of these things. I've referenced so many things from that book in nearly probably every other show, I think, or or something comes up with that. So I think that's one. Um, well, pick one of the questions that you that you got submitted. Just a shout out for Don Norman's The Design of Everyday Things as well. I think that especially in Web3, especially in blockchain, UX, DAP, there's a lot in there. And I think a lot of people would do well to read that book or check out the hour review, eight episode, I think, review of it on thinking on paper.xyz. Yeah, perfect. If you don't have time to read or you don't think you have time to read when you're sitting in traffic, pull up our book club. <laughs> it's just like reading it, but you don't have to do it. And, and we don't um, rage. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I got another one here. I know I asked you, you picked the last question, but I'm looking at this group of questions here that were submitted. Um, what's the most surprising thing you recently learned about quantum? And let's say quantum qu quantum computing. Well, the most surprising. Or the most interesting, like the most interesting thing that you were like, oh, wow, I didn't know that before. And that's that's something that kind of sparks your curiosity. Okay, well, I'm in a I'm in a funky mood, so I'm going to use my <laughs> super positioning entanglement and not give one answer because. So, firstly, the su most surprising thing is that I've actually kind of got my head around the basics of quantum mechanics and quantum computing and how it's working. So, you know, super superposition entanglement, decoherence, error correction, and how. They're, they're thinking about these and how the qubits affect all of those things so the tech that i can understand the technical very 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 basics of it ha has been great and that is surprising because if you'd have asked me that three months ago when we started quantum season i probably would have doubted that um the real world impact i think when we were speaking to jason was it a, a the surprising where the real world impact is going to come from. You don't necessarily think of bi biochemistry. You don't necessarily think of material construction. Your brain doesn't automatically go to these more science-based advancements. You just automatically think of finance and healthcare, which it will, but there's other, these other real world use cases. I was quite, that was quite surprising. Um, I, the order of time, that time doesn't exist, that on the quantum level, there is no single time. It depends where you are in space. There is an infinite number of times. That was very surprising. What about you? The the one thing that, that and this was kind of a most recent aha with Michio Kaku's book um, that, we're, that we're reading, Quantum Supremacy, just the idea that, 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 that the most uh, compelling aspects of nature are quantum mechanical. Yeah. And, okay. and to understand those aspects of nature which we currently don't there's a lot of aspects of nature that we currently don't understand that could be the key to unlocking you know curing of disease feeding the world doing it in a way that doesn't 
you know, doesn't kill the world, right? So um, like mimicking nature, in fact, mimicking yeah. nature. So that, like that quantum computing could actually, because it's quantum mechanical, can solve, can help us understand complex quantum mechanical processes of nature, because the 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 innate technology is lined up. The tech that nature has and the tech that quantum computing has is the same. So we don't have any one super practical examples yet but that is the hope and hopefully maybe we get into more practical examples but that was a big one um so running out of time last question pull it from pull it from your list that you uh that you got from folks what's this this is more for me and you i think what's the one question we're not asking guests that we should be asking guests what are we what are we missing Ah, okay. So like what, what would be something that, um, that, that we're not addressing yet, or we're not sparking in conversation that we could be asking them. I think, I think we're pretty safe when we're not, we're, we're not, we don't try to like stump our guests. So I think that from a, from that perspective, you know, we're, we're pretty thoughtful and careful with, with our questions, but I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of an aspect that we, we could do differently. How would, how would you do it differently? Like, like maybe as a as a bit as a as a sketch a, a bit I think it's called oh, dear. In, in comedy isn't it um, and I, I, we do the carryover question and I'm I'm not sure that we're I'm not sure we're getting the carryover question right in how we're doing it I think it's a good idea I'm not sure asking it as the first question is necessarily the way to go I'm not sure maybe it is. Um, I think it'd be interesting to like post a result of the carryover question as, as it, it almost like as a research experiment, it's a one year long research experiment. That is one question leading to another question, leading to another question. Uh, and maybe we ask our guests to prepare that before, cause we only give them a few minutes in the pre-production tech check to say, Oh, by the way, we're going to be doing a <laughs> carryover question. Like, I don't know, maybe we, maybe we put a little narrative behind it in, in, make that a little bit more directed if we think about it as a research project yeah i like that idea um there was w one question that i've always I, I don't know where i first saw this if somebody asked it to me or if i saw somebody ask somebody else and it, if it's live it really gets the person to wow to think and that's what's the one question that nobody asks you that you always want somebody to ask you in an interview and I think that immediately forces them to to go inside and find what's really driving why they're on thinking on paper, like what their background is, what they're doing in, with emerging tech. So I think that's that would be a good question. Well, people want to tell their story, right? Yeah. And they want people to understand. Sometimes that story is complex, right? And it's hard to connect the dots, especially if you're doing many things, you're living between disciplines, right? Um, so, uh, so that is interesting that, that would, I'm, I'm just thinking about how I would answer that. And it would take a lot of thought yes. uh, to, to, and that'll be good that way. Like, yeah. And there's no, no pressure. You just, you know, we say, look, take your time, but <laughs> then, yeah, we gotta get, we gotta get, some, we gotta get some interstitial videos that we can throw in while people are thinking, but this was a fun episode, Mark. I think we should definitely do it again. Hopefully it resonated with everyone out there. This is our two plus three episode, two topics, three questions. Uh, we'll do it again, Mark, any closing thoughts? Um, no, I enjoyed it. It's, it's sometimes nice to just let the guard down and not ever think, I, I, what is it like positive, positive, um, negativity or something. I mean, you can't, you don't, you can't always be nice about what's happening in the world of emerging technology because it isn't all good, but there is some awesome stuff happening and it's about finding the stuff that matters and is new and creative and kind of fits the thinking on paper ideal i've enjoyed it there you have it be curious stay disruptive keep thinking on paper <laughs> <laughs>